chapter 29, Genesis chapter 29, we're going to be in there in Genesis 30, but let's uh, turn to Genesis 29, we're going to read a few verses, we'll be skipping, so we'll be going to 16 and 17, then verse 31, then, then verse 1 of chapter 30. It's in verse 16, and Laban had two daughters, the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed. I mean, she is kind of plain, a little bit on the ugly side. Uh, said, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Uh, you can pretty well figure what that means. I mean, she is put together good. She is good-looking. She is well-favored. God is good to her. But said her sister on the other side was Homely as a mud fence. But Genesis 29, 31 says, skip on down. It said, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, who was she hated by? She was hated by her sister Rachel, the pretty one. When she saw that Leah, when he saw that, that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. Then notice in verse 1 of chapter 30. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. Give me children or else I die. And I see a real good picture of the church in Rachel. Churches that are preaching, uh, doing a lot of good stuff. The organization of the body is, is, is beautiful, re really beautiful. I mean, everything's beautiful. We see this picture in the Song of Solomon of the church. Uh, 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 the, the, uh, he paints a, uh, you know, the church like a pretty woman. The bride of Christ is a pretty woman. But, but here we see beautiful buildings, beautiful people, beautiful ministry. I mean, it all looks so good. It looks so good. But beautiful as she was, tragically, she was barren. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, is this very term, beautiful, but barren. Beautiful but barren. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, as we come to you today, I pray that you'll help me now to get out what's on my heart, what I believe you placed on my heart. God, I pray that we'll all right now ask you to personalize this message. God, I pray you'll help me to do it. Help me, God, to see myself here. Help me to be painfully honest with myself. Help everybody else do the same. And God, if you'll do that tonight, if we'll do that, then I believe you're going to speak to our hearts tonight. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, the cause of her barrenness. Why was she barren? The cause. Why was beautiful this this beautiful, beautiful gal named Rachel, why was she barren? And the answer to that is because of sin. She hated Leah. She hated her. And because she hated Leah, God had closed up her womb. And got, don't worry, I'm not going to go where most would go here about hobnobbing with liberals and, and saying kumbaya. I'm not going there tonight, but, but let me finish. She had an attitude problem. I mean, in verse 31, it says, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, she, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Things weren't happening the way in Rachel's life that she had planned for them to happen and desired for them to happen. And, and she wasn't a happy camper because things weren't going her way, the way that she wanted it, the way she planned, the way she thought it ought to do, everything wasn't going. God, here's the deal. God was blessing somebody else, and she was mad as a wet hen about it. 
God was blessing so and so. God was blessing her own sister over here. She saw it. She hated that God was blessing her own sister. And because of that, she was barren. I believe God could teach us some things right here in this passage. See, my only responsibility is to be faithful to God and be content with whatever God gives me. See, it's required in stewards that a man be found. I'm talking to me, and you need to say this about you. Your only responsibility is to be faithful to God. It's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Amen. Not handsome, not, not talented, not, not brilliant, but faithful. And God is teaching me this, trying to teach me this, I believe, that, that, that as long as I'm faithful, whether God gives me 300 people or 3,000 people, that, that if I'm faithful, then God has commanded me to be content in my spirit. By the way, I didn't, see not, I didn't say not to be pressing forward. I didn't say not to be reaching forth. I didn't say any of that. But I'm saying in my spirit to be faithful and to be content with whatever God's given me. Well, don't you understand this? The church and pulpits are filled with people with bad attitudes. We got people who've got bad attitudes toward themselves. You are what you are by God's grace. You got people that's got attitude, bad attitudes toward other people. And we've got people in our church right now that got bad attitudes about other people in the church. You know what? And, and you know what? You, you say, well, brother, I got good cause to be, to be my do you? Remember last week I talked to you about what the scripture said about being angry without a cause. You, you know what you've got cause to be angry for? I mean, have you ever looked that up in the Bible and said, what do I really have cause to be angry for? It's a short list as far as stuff between us. Did you hear what I'm saying about it here? Listen to me. The things I have a right to be angry about among people in the church is a very short list. I mean, doctrinal heresy, you go in the book of Revelation, and it says that they were dealing with doctrinal heresy. I've got a right to be angry about doctrinal heresy. I, I've got a right to be, I mean, if somebody starts going back into Judaism, I've got a right to disagree strongly with that and to be angry about that. I, I've got a right to be angry uh, about those things, about the devil coming. I've got a right to be angry when there's immorality and things like that. I mean, we have a right to be angry angry about that but I'm going to guarantee you some of the things we have bad attitudes about are dumb I mean dumb 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 I want my way I want it done my way I want everything to be my way and you know what we've got a bad attitude toward ourselves we've got an attitude toward others and we've even got an attitude toward God why in the world would God allow this to happen that's what she's doing it's like in the church sometimes you can ask people sometimes how they are, and they'll say, I'm here. It's a bad attitude. I like when people give me good answers. How you doing? <laughs> I don't want to pick on Robert, because when I pick on Robert, it makes people not like him. When you hold somebody... <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, when, when I point a guy out that's friendly and, and got a good attitude and a smile on his face, what it does, it makes people not like him. But, 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 understand that. But, but I asked Robert a ago, I said, how are you, Robert? He says, oh, get, t tell me what you said. I, I forgot. Just a little bit shy of, of incredible. Just a little bit shy of incredible. Bob, yeah, I'm marvelous, but I'm getting better. I mean, huh, what's that? Always room for improvement, yes, but at the same time, not in the muddy grubs over it. We can all learn from that principle. I mean, whether it's Robert or whether it's somebody, I'm talking, hey, I'm not that way either. But you know what? I want to be more that way. I would like to be more that way when somebody comes. Now, I know sometimes I'm cross, sometimes I'm joking with you, I'm, but I'm talking about in the real life and being serious. I want to be the kind of guy that doesn't have a bad attitude all the time. I really do want that in my life. I want that for this church. The cause of her barren, I'm talking about Rachel now. Why was she barren? She had a bad attitude. She was also jealous of, of Leah. Verse 30 tells us that. Jealousy is a real problem in the ministry. By the way, let me say this. Be very careful of who 
and what you're jealous of. Be real careful. See, you might not like what you get because things are not always what they seem, and many times we have no clue as to the price of what we think we want. I just said a mouthful there, but it made sense to me anyway. You might not like what you get because things are not always what they seem, and many times we have no clue as to the price of what we think we want. There's a lot of people look at somebody else and says, I want what they got. You have no idea the price that was paid for what they got. I'd like to have what they have, but yet you have no idea the price that was paid for what they've got. And, and by the way, and the, the, the idea about it is you may not be willing to pay that price. But yet you got a bad attitude and you're jealous because somebody's got more than you or somebody's doing better than you. And then the church, somebody may be on the stage more than you or somebody's more recognized than you. Somebody may be more talented than you. Let me tell you something. If I was jealous because, I mean, listen to me, all three of those people on the stage today could sing better than me. They all can. That's why I was glad Zach is back tonight because Zach can't. But, but, but anyway, you, you know what I mean? I understand that we're, we're all, I mean I, I, I mean, I used to be a singer. But yet these people stand up here and sing, they sing better than me. Well, then I don't like them. I don't like them no more. I've got a bad attitude, so I'm only going to throw a dollar in the offering plate because I don't like them. The cause of her barrenness, she was jealous of Leah. Sin, bad attitude. But let me look at the charge. We see the cause of her barrenness. But let's see the charge of her barrenness. Notice in chapter 30, verse 1 and 2, it says, When Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, that's the pretty one by there, there's Rachel, the pretty one. Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Anybody see what's happening here? It's your fault, Jacob. Well, let me stop here for a minute just in case some of y'all, I, I want to paint you a picture here. Rachel's the one that Jacob thought he was getting to start with. You remember that? He worked for her for seven years, and then when he finally got to the bedroom of the honeymoon, it was the wrong. I mean, have you ever thought, I mean, what a kick in the head that would be. You've worked seven years for a woman, and you marry, and you get married, and you go to the, to the honeymoon, and it's the wrong one. And she's ugly. That's not, that's not a good day. He married the one he didn't want to marry. Then he had to work seven more years for the pretty one. Now, what I'm saying to you, I don't think it was Jacob's fault because Jacob is the one that wanted the pretty one to start with. Jacob, y'all get my drift? Jacob wanted to be with the pretty one. It says, when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I, I mean, hey, give me, it's your fault. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And that's what he said. He says, am I in God's stead? Now, now, folks, here's what this means. That means Jacob is saying to her, I've been doing what was supposed to, you know, be producing children. He said, but am I in God's stead? Who, who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? She blamed Jacob because she wasn't having no kids. Let me ask you, who, are, who or what are you blaming? I mean, 
If you don't have any fruit in your ministry, if you're not winning anybody to Jesus, if, you, if you've had to stand before God right now, uh, you would have no fruit to offer up and say, here's my fruit. I was on planet earth for one reason, to live for Jesus and to bear fruit. He said, you told me to bear fruit that remain. He said, you told me to occupy till I come. My primary responsibility was not to make money. It was not to, to you know, to have a big house. You weren't concerned about the car I drove or the annuity. I had my primary responsibility in being on the earth was to bear fruit and I don't have any and I'm going to tell you something most of our church at Cornerstone Church most of the people in our church are right there you don't have no fruit you never won nobody to Jesus you hadn't invited nobody to G. You, you hadn't went through the Romans road with anybody in a long time. You hadn't told somebody your testimony at work. You hadn't said, have I told you about when I got saved, how my life was changed. You haven't got any fruit. She blamed Jacob. And folks, I guarantee you, we're blaming all kinds of reasons why we're not doing better. Some would say, well, I'm too old. I'm too old to do the work of God. I'm too old to do that. I, I, you know what? I, I have, I'm going to say that myself. I'm getting up there. I'm feeling the aches and pains of, of being old. I mean, I, I understand. I understand that. That, that, that. I talked about that Wednesday night. You can't do everything you could do when you was 20 years old. But understand that. But some of us need to understand we're not dead yet. Some of us need to do like, you, you remember Elisha was on his deathbed. Any of y'all remember that story? Elisha, the Bible says, was on his deathbed. And Joash the king came in to see him. Anybody remember that story? Joash came in to see Elisha, and he's wanting a word, and it says he's on his deathbed. The man of God's on his deathbed. And what he did was one of the greatest stories in the Bible. He got up uh, when the king come in and says, the enemy's invading. What are we going to do? It says that Elisha got off of his deathbed and he gave some instruction to that young king. He said, I want you to go shoot arrows. Remember that? Go shoot arrows out the window. And, and then he took and shot three arrows out the window. And, and but what I'm trying to say, if you'll read that, read that sometime. I ain't got time to preach on it. But, but he literally got up out of his deathbed. Everybody listen. Everybody that's over 45. Well, let, let, let's give you a break. Everybody that's over 45, listen to me. The rest of you just sit there. He got up off of his deathbed and literally put his arms around that young king and showed him and did this and, and literally showed him what, what he needed to do. I believe it's time for some of us that think we're past our youthfulness and, and some of us that think that, that, that we just got too many gray hairs and thinking we're just too old and too stove up. I think it's time that maybe one last time, hey, hey, how about it? Hey, about, how about us get off our deathbed and say, hey, one more time, I'm going to do what? I believe God's got something to do. There's a young man out there that needs somebody to put to and to show him how to live for God. You remember he got angry. Elisha was still had enough zip in him. He got angry when the king only shot three times after he shot him out, after he showed him how to shoot. He said, what are you? He said, if you had have shot a whole bunch, you would have totally annihilated the enemy. But now God's going to give you three victories. He said he should have shot the whole quiver pool, and we'd been done with this mess. That's a whole other message. That would, that'd be a good message, by the way. I'm going to ask you, who are you blaming? I'm too old. And then some of you youngsters back there, you're saying, well, I'm too young and inexperienced. Let me ask you, let, let's ask us, when is the right time to do something for Jesus? If I'm too old, or if I'm too young, then when is the right time to do something for Jesus? Did you realize some of you youngsters that energy and smarts might be a wash? Just a thought. Some would say, well, uh, why they're not doing anything? Why they don't have no fruit? Why, why they don't have any children? Well, we're just living in bad and wicked times. Yeah, we are. But the Bible says the fields are white unto harvest. 
And you know what? There's 7.3 billion people. I got on the internet to right before this message, uh, 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 updated my notes from the pre for in earlier in the week. It was 7.167 billion and now it's already up to seven almost point three probably by the time i get back in there it'll already be at 7.3 it shows you how many people are dying uh, every second how many people are being born it gives you the world clock and and it's changing the population of the world is growing every day we've got 7.3 billion people to draw from and the technology is on our side See, right now, those cameras back there is going to be beaming this. If I can get those guys to put that on the Internet, I guarantee you they're going to beam this, and, and it'll go on Sermon Audio, and you can get on there, and all across the world people can watch this message. Technology's on our side if we'll use it. So that dog won't hunt either. Well, we're just living in bad times. Yeah, that's why they need a Savior. You know what? There's more people that need a Savior today than there were when Jesus walked the planet. I mean, have you ever done a study on how many people were in the entire world in the first century? Less than a billion. Less than a billion in the entire world. And Jesus said then, the woods is full of them. Let me tell you something, folks. The woods are still full of them. There's people out there, and it's not an excuse to say we live in bad times. And sometimes we even blame God. That God's intent has not changed. He still wants to save people. And then she looked at, she blamed Jacob. And then she looked to Jacob to give her children. I need to talk here for a minute. Children are from the Lord. That's what the prophet says. Blessed is a man whose quiver is full of them. Children are from the Lord. Well, let me tell you something, folks. Souls, children born in the kingdom of God, they're also from the Lord. See, there's always going to be people that let you down. That's why we follow Jesus instead of following men. Hebrews chapter 12 says, look unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I mean, we, we understand this, the charge of her barrenness. She was blaming. She blamed Jacob. And I want to ask us who we're blaming. I've had to ask myself that question quite a bit. But here's what I want you to understand tonight. This church, which is Rachel, it's not just up to me and staff and deacons and to bear children. It, it, it's up to all of us. God's the one that's going to give the increase. If we'll go back to point one, our responsibility is to be faithful. To be faithful to do what God has asked us to do. But you know what? The truth of the matter is we are not doing what God has asked us to do. We're not soul winning. We're not winning people to Christ. We're not going to the highways and hedges compelling them to come in the way the New Testament church should be doing. You're not doing it on your workplace. You're not doing it in your neighborhood. We're not, as I'm saying, we are not doing what God has asked us to do. It's awful quiet in here. But I want to hurry now, since you're not going to amen me. I'm going to go to the third part. The, the third part. I want to see the consequences of barrenness. The consequences of barrenness. God had withheld the fruit of her womb. God had with, had withheld his blessing. Verse 31. God had withheld blessing. Y'all still know who the characters in the story are, don't you? You do know that Rachel's the church in this story. The Rachel's us. Now, some of y'all look out, and you, you could be Leah because you're ugly, but, but, but I'm saying, but the church is, that I'm talking to is Rachel. God, had, here's the consequences. God withheld the fruit. No souls not being saved as they should. 
altars empty, church is cold and lifeless, souls dying without hope all around us. And then I thought about this. Maybe God won't let a bunch of children be born in a mess. Just a thought. Until Rachel gets her act together, God ain't going to give her no kids. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. I can see a message here for Cornerstone Church. That if we don't get our act together as a church, as a people, as a family of God, maybe God won't let me children be born. And then here's what happens. Here's the consequences of being barren. And we can see this all over the church world. We begin to look for a shortcut for fruit and revival. We begin to look for shortcuts for fruit, for blessing, for revival. Oh, we, we try to make the church more comfortable and more user-friendly. We've done that. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. And then if you'll notice something else, she bargained for Reuben's mandrakes in, ver in chapter 20, verse 14 through verse 15. They, they, they had this root called a mandrake that's supposed to, to, to be this, this miracle drug that would make a woman have kids. Well, maybe God's not working so uh, anymore, so maybe we need to get a better way. God's not working anymore, so we're going to have to find a better, we're going to need to help God out. So we let down on our standards. That's what the church has done. We adopt worldly methods. And I know we could argue on the fine points of this. Just let the Spirit speak to you, okay? But guys, I've been there and done that. And you know what? I found out that even this church, even this church, is not the better church because I'm not as hard a preacher as I used to be. I'm still going to use technology. I'm still going to do that. I'm still going to do all that stuff. But what I'm saying to you, she was trying to help God out. She gave her maiden, and she, she bargained for, for Reuben's mandrakes. That's one thing she did. Okay, I'm, I'm going to take some drugs I'm, to make myself more fertile. And then she gave her maid to Jacob in chapter 30, verse 3 and 7. We need to help God out here. You say, well, that was okay back in that day. No, it wasn't. There's one problem with this kind of reasoning. God don't need our help. When God decides to send children, God don't need our help. We just need to be faithful to what God has said to do. We look for substitutes. Oh, if we just had what that church had, if we had that church's money, if someone gave us a bunch of money, we could do this, we could do that. If, if, if we just had their singers, if we just had their preacher, if we just had, if we just had, if we just had, if we just had, I mean, Leah sitting there, I mean, uh, Rachel sitting there saying, oh, oh, if, we, if I just had, if I just, and understand, she didn't have no kids. We look for substitutes. That's the consequences of our barrenness. But let me hasten on and be done. Let's look at the cure. That's where we need to get to anyway. Let's look at the cure for her barrenness. Notice in verse 22, the chapter 30. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God had taken away my reproach. Now what's the cure? 
You ought to be real interested in this. Here it is. Rachel got down to business with God. She quit blaming. She quit hating. And she got down to business with God. Folks, let me tell you something. If we in this church would get down to business with God in our prayer life, in soul winning, in faithfulness, in realization of where it all comes from, if we would get all that down, if we would get all that and get down to business with God, I guarantee you that's the cure for barrenness. I'm talking to every one of us here. Verse 22 says, and God hearkened to Rachel. It said God took away her reproach. And I'm going to say this, I'm almost done, listen to me. If we're not having children, we are reproached as a ministry, as a church. If we're not having precious souls come into the kingdom, we're reproached. Our prayer might should be, as her prayer was, give me children or else I die. Because tell me the truth, folks. If we don't get more children being born into this family, we're going to die. You say, I look around, I see quite a few young folks. We need some desperate and definite praying. We need to get business with God. Listen, we need to get down to business with God. I mean, we as staff need to get down to business with God. We need to be more concerned about our prayer life and, and, and about our relationship to God and soul winning. We need to be more concerned about that than we are about all the other junk. We, I, 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 well, see, we have people coming, that, that these singers come out, and they was looking at our ministry, and they was looking at the, at the freezers, and they was looking at all the food, and they you know, wanting to know all about that. And the guy said, you know what, uh, that's what a New Testament church should do. And I agree with that. I agree with that statement. And they were just, uh, you know, Laura, we don't know of another church anywhere that does what you guys are doing. Homeless ministry, feeding the hungry, you know, mission work you're doing, Moldova, all that, that different stuff. But understand this. This. It's beautiful. You're beautiful. You're beautiful, they're saying. You're beautiful. Beautiful ministry. But if we're beautiful and barren, what good's it doing? Beautiful but barren. See, back in that day, for a woman not to have kids was a bad deal. I mean, the, the family's name had to do with the kids they had. They're the ones that carried on the lineage, uh, m much more important than what it is in America. It was a big deal. I mean, and she said, I've got to have kids or I'm going to die. I'd rather be dead. Then I have children. But folks, we as a church, if we're not having precious souls born in the kingdom of God, let me say this. There's a bunch of churches that are holding services that need to shut their doors. I go to churches all across this land, and you, you, you'll go and you'll see, uh, when's the last time somebody walked out? They don't remember. And we certainly don't have a whole lot to brag about these days, even at our church, but do better than some. Lee Robinson made a statement years ago. He said if the church is not uh, winning and baptizing seven folks a week, they're not a New Testament church. Because it said the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I understand that was a history. That's, that's what was happening on that day. I understand that. And I'm not saying that I said that statement. I'm saying Lee Robinson said that. Isaiah 66, 7. I want you to see this. I want everybody to turn in your Bible. In fact, he'll put it up there. Just look up there. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 6 and 7. I want everyone to read that real. I want you to read it with an open heart. I want you to read that. And then just and notice what it says. It says in Isaiah, verse 6. By the way, it's not talking about Rachel here. It's talking about Zion. It said, therefore, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. 
Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such thing? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or a nation be born at once? For as soon as, tra as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. And I know how Lindsay says that's talking about the birth of Israel and, you know, or the Six-Day War. Some say, I, I, folks, I'm going to tell you what, I believe that's talking about Zion. I believe that there's a symbolic meaning there, a spiritual meaning. It's not just talking about the nation of Israel. I believe it's talking to us right there, too. That I'm going to tell you what, until we travail, we're not going to bring forth children. There's some labor pains involved with bringing forth children. There's a price to pay. And the truth of the matter is, we're not travailing. We don't want to be inconvenienced. None of us. None of us. Preacher, assistant preacher, we're glad to haul food around. You know what? I'd rather haul food all day long and unpack food than to, than to go knock doors on people that don't want, me, don't want to see me. I, I, wouldn't you? I'd, re I'd rather haul food and say, look at me. I'm doing something for the glory of God. And all you people that are helping the food, man, I'm glad for you. know I love you. We have a great time. But I guarantee it's a great It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But I'm afraid sometimes we're beautiful. Our music up here, hey, when we're on, when our singers are on, it's beautiful. When these girls are playing the piano and the organ, and, and David's on the bass, and boy, you got Joseph and, 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 and Deborah, and, and maybe have a mandolin up here, uh, maybe even have a, you know, a horn up here, a saxophone or something. It's beautiful. Our singers get up and sing, beautiful. So was Rachel. But she was barren. I don't want to be beautiful but barren. I'd rather be ugly and have a bunch of kids. I'd rather be entirely... And having a bunch of kids. Than to be beautiful. And barren. What are we talking about tonight? Talking to our church and I'm talking to you as families and I'm talking to you as individuals. Are you beautiful but barren? I didn't say you as bad people. How long has it been since you got honest and prayed through? Since you travailed? How long has it been since you were so burdened over somebody that's lost that you literally travailed? You know what the bad thing about having to be the preacher is you've got to ask yourself this question while you're typing it out. That when's the last time I ached? That I had pain because somebody that I loved, somebody I knew was lost and going to go to hell. If they didn't get born, they're going to go to hell. You say, well, I, I asked prayer for them. That's beautiful. You should. When's the last time you travailed? Oh, God. Oh, God. When's the last time you missed a meal over somebody that's not saved? Over a situation in your life? I'm talking to you now. And let's go past souls. I'm talking about fruit that remains. You got family problems. You got home problems. When the, when's the last time you travailed over? I didn't say whined about it. When's the last time you travailed to God about it? That you fasted and prayed and you're, oh, God. I can't take the situation I'm in. Oh, God, you've got to help me. I'm going to tell you what, I'll be done. When that young and over there, right over there, was laying in a coma, and they give us no hope whatsoever of her living, 
I'm going to tell you what, Sister Karen and I learned how to travail. Oh. We sat by her bed and we, oh, oh, couldn't cry. Oh, because we hurt so bad. How long has it been since you travailed over anything? Over souls, over your family, over your home, over your children, over your wife, over your husband. Oh, God. Oh, God. Help, oh, God. He said, when Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. what needs to happen you want some fruit there's some there's some people there's some families here that need some fruit in your family there's some of you need fruit in your marriage some of you need fruit you understand fruit blessing that's what this is all about blessing how long has it been since you got honest and prayed through travailed over anything because a church that's not birthing souls is not, has lost its reason for existing. I said, somebody said something the other day to me. We were talking about church growth. And, see, if we're going to expect to compete with the world, we've done lost that battle before we start. And someone was talk, sound, talking about some of these churches that are popping up or these organizations that are popping up. They're stealing members right and left. I understand. Listen, if you're going to try to, if you're going to, try to match their program, you've, lost the, you've already lost because they've hired theirs done. Yeah. Lost the battle. But I guarantee you get me some people that are travailing. You give me some people that are yearning, some people that are honest. And then some people that want, once they travail, then they're willing to do what God says to do. They're willing to be faithful. I guarantee you, we're going to have some children being born in this ministry. We're going to have some fruit being born in our homes. We're going to have fruit being born in our families. We're going to have fruit. We're going to have fruit all over. The, we're going to have blessings all over the place. Amen. Are you beautiful? But barren. Let's bow our heads and pray.